So this uh, album comes in at number 69 on Best Ever Albums in the 1970s, number 8 in the year 1972, and number 276 of all time. All this on Best Ever Albums. It is listed as Jethro Tull's highest rated album on Best Ever Albums, and like Raw Power, it is, did not make the Rolling Stone list. Uh, we did cover Jethro Tull earlier this season on Episode 8 when we covered Aqualung, which was the album that preceded this one. That was their fourth album. This is their fifth. Thick as a Brick was recorded in December of 1971, released on March 3rd, 1972. And it basically has the same band members that it did for Aqualung, main uh, founding uh, and, and member and lead singer Ian Anderson, who also played the acoustic guitar, flute, violin, trumpet, saxophone, and accordion, multi-instrumentalist Ian Anderson. Martin Barr plays the electric guitar, the lute, and the flute. So lots of lute playing on here. John Evan on the piano, organ, and harpsichord. Jeffrey Hammond uh, was on the bass guitar. And also the, the, the spoken word, the little spoken word parts that you heard in here was uh, done, oh, about was the done by Jeffrey Hammond. Uh, yes, the, yeah. the duck guy. <laughs> Uh, the drummer is new, actually, though. Uh, the drummer, was, uh, Clive Bunker was the drummer for Aqualung, but the, he was replaced by Barrymore Barlow. Barlow, excuse me, Barrymore Barlow. Uh, I guess Clive Bunker, after touring for Aqualung, just wanted, was one of those things where he wanted to uh, spend more time with his family, didn't really like touring, so they got a new drummer. So, But everybody else is basically the same. So this album comes off the heels of Aqualung, which if you guys remember when we talked about that that album, Many people, critics and fans uh, regard and even the research that I did, uh, you know, came up with uh, the, 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 the idea that it was a concept album. And mm -hmm. Ian Anderson was, has always, you know, um, argued that it's not a concept album. You know, um, he said, I always said at the time, this is not a concept album. It's an album of varied songs in which three or four are kind of the keynote pieces for the album, but it doesn't make it a concept album. So he just got really annoyed with all this talk of, of concept albums. So. He's like, all right, here you go. I'm going to create the quote mother of all concept albums, um, and this is a this is satire, right? So this album was created to make fun of concept albums, to make wow. fun of prog bands, to make fun of the critics and the fan, like everybody. Like they, he was just they were really into Monty Python. Um, he was influenced by Monty Python's humor, and he wrote a suite, you know, uh, that that combined a lot of complex musical ideas with a sense of humor to make fun of all these different things. Um, so. Uh, but a lot of people didn't get the joke. <laughs> um, so the original packaging, John, you had asked about that. Uh, you, you know, the uh, the news because it, the front of the album is like a it's like a newspaper uh, article, and it's designed like a newspaper. It claims to be. Um, uh, the, the, in, in that paper, it claims that this is a musical adaptation of an epic, epic poem by a fictional eight-year-old genius called Gerald Bostock. And many <laughs> believed, actually, that this Bostock guy, what kid, was a real person. I'll get a little bit more to that in just a second. Uh, this is considered by many critics to be the, the first true prog rock album that Jethro Tull ever did. I know we talked a little bit about Aqualung being a prog rock album. Um, I think at the time I was kind of thinking, I don't know if I would say that this is a prog rock album. So there's some debate there. There should be no debate here. This is m most definitely like a, a, pro a prog rock album. It did receive mixed reviews, but it actually sold well, reaching number five in the United Kingdom and number one in the U.S., and um, the rehearsals occurred in the Rolling Stones basement studio in, in Bermondsey, England. Uh, there was no real initial intent to create one song, which essentially I, I should say that that's what this album is. It's, you know, Thick as a Brick Part 1, Thick as a Brick Part 2, which are only separated into Part 1 and Part 2 because you can't fit 43 minutes of songs onto a standard LP. Yeah. So they had to cut it at the half halfway point. Um, and then when you flip it over, it kind of transitions in. But if you just listen to it actually on Spotify or on a CD, even though there's going to be a, 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 a time stamp for one track versus the other, mm -hmm. it really does flow into, you know, the, the one part flows into the next. So it, it can be uh, played as a individual one long song. But that wasn't the original intention. He did have – Anderson had some ideas written down. He would um, – but but most of the album was actually written and created in the studio. So it, the, the, the way that the procedure would work was that Anderson would get up in the, early in the morning. He would, uh, you know, write a little bit, put something together, bring it to the studio later on, and then the band would work out of the various parts and then put it together. And then through the re recording process, they just decided, well, let's just let's write little pieces in here, little transitions and make sure and just have it 
if it's going to be this crazy, ridiculous album, let's just make mm-hmm. it all one song. So that, that kind of came up later on. The recording process was pretty fun. Everybody had a good time, so there really wasn't a whole lot of acrimony going on. Um, there's a lot of different time changes, time signatures and tempo shifts in the, the, but none of the, none of the parts of the, of the song, uh, of of the different parts of the song really last more than five minutes. It usually transitions from one place to the next. Mm -hmm. Um, so more on the cover, (laughs) it actually, when you bought the, the, the original album on LP, it actually opened up into 12 pages. So there were several articles in this fictional newspaper, which was called the St. Cleve Chronicle and Linwell Advertiser. Uh, you could find the lyrics of the song on page seven, and they were presented as a long-form poem by this uh, this child Bostock, this child genius. Um, the main story on the front of the uh, album cover is a story about Bostock being disqualified from a poetry competition um, over concerns that re- regarding the offensive nature of his poems, his psychological instability, and there's actually an accusation in there that says that he was the father of his 14-year-old friend's child, even though he was only eight. <laughs> um, again, some people didn't pick up on that this was a joke. Yeah. So the pieces were written by a couple members of the band, including Anderson, Hammond, and Evan. And most of the characters in the articles are based on the band members, the production team, um, and the crew. Uh, Anderson actually once said that the creation of the paper actually took longer than the music on the album. (laughs) So they spent more time doing that stupid thing than they did actually the music of the album. Yeah, that sounds complicated. Yeah, yes. Uh, So following a couple more things, the following the the release of the album, they did tour and perform the entire piece as part of their tour, but they would incorporate various other aspects into the show. Uh, This would include certain breaks here and there for news and weather reports, as well as a random dude on a scuba in scuba gear walking across the stage and Ian Anderson actually fielding a telephone call mid song. He would stop the music and go talk on the phone so uh it baffled audiences particularly in japan for some reason (laughs) japan japanese audiences were really baffled by this but uh that this is all in the guise of like you know this again this is all satire they're making fun of all of this stuff but um so a couple got mixed reviews again. Robert Criscow uh, disliked the album. Uh, Village Voice Robert's Chris, Robert Criscow saying, quote, it's the usual shit from the band. Rock <laughs> getting heavier, folk getting fair, classical getting schlockier, and flute getting better because it has no choice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then Jordan Blum of Pop Matters thinks that the album, quote, paved the way for modern progressive rock. And today it represents not only a pinnacle of achievement for Jethro Tull, but also a concrete example of just how adventurous and free artists used to be. Uh, this is a highly regarded prog rock album. It's made lists like the uh, like the uh, Prague Magazine listed as number five of all time of uh, the best prog rock albums. Rolling Stone listed at number seven. And I think we talked about this before, but again, Rush's Getty Lee and Iron Maiden Steve Harris have both cited it as one of their all-time favorite albums. So those guys, big fans of Aqualung, big fans of, of Jethro Tull's uh, Thick as a Brick. And uh, so, yeah, I will. Uh, I have a little bit of a postscript here on the band, but this is what we're listening to today. And I think we have to go with John uh, of your take. I can't wait to hear this. Thick as a brick. What do you think, buddy? I really like this album, actually. Okay. Wow. wow. I would really, really like this album if it didn't have the stupid flute in it. But it's. <laughs> but the flute, you, you just mentally prepare yourself for it. It was. Um... I feel like the flute's not as. It's not as prominent. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's basically that, like, you know, medieval times, like, dun, 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 yeah. you know, that comes in and you're just like, ugh. But then it disappears. And then once again, like the first, like like uh, Aqualung, I shouldn't say first album, like Aqualung, the guitar parts are really jammy. And, you know, for a, for a prog rock band, right, you could see why Rush likes this band so much because yeah. they're the only prog rock band I can think of in terms of 70s prog rock that rocks this hard, you know, and they really do, you know, and, and mm-hmm. the joke about, you know, Jethro Tull is almost impossible to think about them without that flute, right? And it's there, but, you know, the all the other hallmarks that are the good parts of prog rock are here. I actually think that the two parts of it, side one and side two, which also, as you probably would imagine, line up with the album sides, um, are a nice little break, and they are different pieces. But thematically, they they do come together for a nice overall piece. Um, It doesn't overstay its welcome. As I said before, the the guitar was a real standout for this. Uh, And I liked... um, the callback points, right? I liked where yep. they, with the exception of, which, you know, is another, 
uh, we saw that with yes and everything like that before the callback points and probably we'll talk about that as we go on so I'll give other people space for that but you know there is a callback with the flute which I mentioned before that like which you know you go but then it goes into these these guitar parts that scaffold off and then they keep adding complexity before kind of coming back to these codas and I just sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but you have to like the parts that they're playing uh, and in that way you know what it kind of reminded me of a little bit guys the more time that's going on that Pharaoh Sanders album and the more time that we go on the more I recognize how much that Pharaoh Sanders album was like a prog rock album even though it was jazz when you think about it because it builds up with the chaos and had like touch points that came back to the increase and then it kind of weaved its way out and it's sort of its own thematic mm -hmm. um way so yeah i i really did like this album and um the vocals work for me and uh yeah, this one gets a thumbs up for me, guys. I know that might surprise Matt, but um, yeah, a little bit, yeah. You know, but I, I see what exception. you're saying too. At the yeah. same time, yeah, if you can, you can tolerate. And I think there's a lot of loot when you do the. Dun, 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 dun. I think there's, I think there's loot in there too to even yeah. even add more uh, of that medieval flavor to it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't stay like for those that might. There's some people that would, are hearing that and going, "Ooh, I love that." Then there are some people that are like, that sounds interesting, but I'll check it out. Some people go, I'm skeptical, but I sometimes like stuff. And then there's people that are going to say, oh, just file that away. I will <laughs> say that it's not as you can you can ignore it more than you could in Aqualung, in my opinion. Like in Aqualung, it it it, it just violated your space too often. And this, it kind of keeps its lane and you can it doesn't you know, violate you as much as it did in the Aqualung album. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But Josh, <laughs> right. what about your thoughts? Well, I, I must be thick as a brick because I did not respond to this album as positively as you did. I, mm. I think I liked I liked Aqualung more. Um, I have a hard time. I am now finding I have a hard time with these prog rock albums that are a single track. I have a hard time parsing out a different mm -hmm. the different beats within the track. And, and also as a result like i forget you know even if i write stuff down like musically i can't remember kind of the callbacks f from the beginning of the song into the, the that they do in the middle and maybe even on the second track on the back side and i agree that the flute is uh less pronounced here and i liked when pretty much whenever they jam out with the guitars is what I like the most. It, and the flute kind of disappears when they're jamming out. They're not really integrating it in that way. But because the songs are so long and because this is basically almost like one long story, obviously, I really didn't pay attention to the lyrics that much. This would be an album where I would, I would need to read the lyrics as I was listening to it, I think, in order to understand the, the, the commentary and the meta-ness of that and the, and the satire, I didn't pick up on that on the times that I listened to it. I was trying to track the music and, and kind of mm -hmm. feel if it was capturing me the way it did with Aqualung and it didn't. And I kept kind of like drifting off and, and, and something interesting would happen like a guitar part or something, but then I kept drifting off again. So it was hard to like get in the zone on this album for me where I think I responded to Aqualung more and I feel like, it was kind of more concise in some ways. I mean, there was more tracks too, but it was, I was able to kind of grapple with what it was doing and, and, and understand it better as a result. Can I ask um, both of you, how many times did you listen to this? Uh, two. Like, yeah. Two, two and a half. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I had I I didn't know this album. Um, I I think I knew parts. I knew how it began. So the beginning was was familiar to me. Mm -hmm. But I for the most part I never really listened to this. So I had a, kind of an interesting listening experience because the first I listened. I don't know how many. I probably listened to it maybe four or five times. Um, and so when I the first couple of listens, I, I I first of all I don't think I was listening too intently, which might have been a little bit you know if. Because I think if you're not really listening, like paying attention to this, this yeah. is hard to really get if it's in the background. You know what I mean? Like you kind of have to, you have to focus a little bit more. At least I do. Um, yeah. And my, was, my I first... was listening to it in the car, and it was even hard there, even though you're just kind of yeah. I could yourself. see that. I could I could see that. Although yeah. Um, so 
one of my initial reactions was there's a lot going on here, right? Mm-hmm. And that's and I think that that's true. This is a full <laughs> song. It's not even yeah. a, this is a song, right? Whatever. Yeah, it's, it's just it's there's lots of stuff going on here. Um, so. It, it's and it's hard for me, you know, in just one or two listens to really, you know, kind of get what's going on or to try to to try to figure it out, right? So, and it reminded me just of something, you know, within within prog rock or certain types of music about how I, you know, for me, I need to listen to things multiple times before I start to either if I'm going to get it, you know, before I get to that point. And so yeah. this is definitely falling into that category for me because by the end of the week. Um, I, I was uh, I, I was feeling it much more, and I was I was I was reciting. You know, parts of the song were going through my head afterwards. You know, mm. and there were parts where they do, like you guys say, they do they do call back other parts of the of the album. But I'm still at the point right now when they call something back in my head. I'm going, okay, is that the be is it, or did they just start that, or was that something that I heard earlier? Yeah, you you know what I mean. Like, where exactly is this falling in line? So I'm still not familiar enough with this album to really talk about you know how I feel about it. Generally speaking, I do like it a lot though. There's there's a lot of cool stuff going on here, um, and it is kind of one of those things. Even if it is, even though it is only one song, if there's a part you don't like, just hang in there for a couple minutes because they're going to change it up. You know what I mean? So even the parts that kind of are a little bit weaker. It's not like to me they do any major disservice to it because it's going to get to something else later on. And that's kind of one of the interesting things about this type of music is that um, it, it, it's, 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 it's a different experience listening to this type of music yeah. than it is your traditional five, three, four, five minute long song. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not quite sure if I like this better than Aqualung or not. That's I, I'm still having to say I like them both quite a bit. Aqualung, I'm certainly more familiar with. It's more traditional. Um, I, there's probably I could say at this moment there's I have there's higher highs on Aqualung than I would say here. Um, the flute never really bothers me. So if they wanted to, you know, if they, it is it is a little bit more to the background here, um, but that doesn't bother me at all. I kind of like it, and I think it kind of mixes things up in an interesting way that's very Jethro Tull. But um, but this is the type of progress. Like I like this a lot more than I liked Yes. Um, and I did like mm-hmm. the Yes albums, um, and they're still in prog rock. But as th- this is kind of a little bit more in line with my feelings on Genesis, which we're going to, I believe, get to very soon. Um, so I'm going to be interested to hear it because that's a band I'm very familiar with, very much like their, the, the, the prog music coming from them. Uh, and uh, But this is kind of, I, I was kind of feeling similar to this. Uh, this is more in line with Genesis than something like Yes. Yes seems more, as John would say, like clinical math. It's very like... It, it, it's it's really hard to describe the differences. This to me is just more. It it is like they just piece together n- like typical songs and mm-hmm. then just blended them all together. Whereas the yes thing was kind of just like let's do like really strange stuff, you know, and really, you know, or really, um, I don't know, very calculated, very over the top, you know, the, the, with the time sig- signatures and things like that. Where this is a little bit more straightforward, perhaps. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining that well or not, but generally speaking, I do like this. I think I think this is something, Josh. Like you're like I'm confused, I'm baffled by this. If you're like me, you got to listen to this multiple times. Yeah. Um, you know, John likes it after two. You know, maybe he's doing a little different. You're hearing it, you're hearing things enough for him. But to me, it, it's not surprising that someone would need to kind of would need to sit with this for a while because this is a little like doing homework. I think you know, yeah. this is a little bit of a of a music homework kind of a project, um, as opposed to raw power, which you could listen to once and be like, okay, I got it. Like you know, you can listen to one song and get it with there. But this yeah. is a little different. But uh, if you're adventurous and you're you're willing to kind of explore music in a different way. Um, I, this is a big thumbs up. There's a lot of cool stuff going on here. I think, I think a, while you were speaking, this popped in my head. I think a interesting or cool way that they could make this more of an experience is if you listen to it like in pop up video style, like on YouTube. Like you would get <laughs> things would come up in like snippets or like annotations to the song, so that you can kind of like follow along, or they could like reference things that like here's where you know they referenced this earlier on in the song or something like that. I think that would be like a multimedia way to kind of get that. You could, you could do that, but I would advocate just listen to like the more, like once you listen to it enough, you'll get all that stuff. Like you'll, you'll peck up on it. You'll know everything, you know, and you'll know what parts are coming up next and stuff like that. That'll Mm. happen. But that's again, it's homework. You gotta, yeah. You gotta, do you feel like you understood the, you were understanding the story, the time. No, not at all. No, don't oh. listen to this for the story. No, 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 no. If you're trying to do that, you're wasting your time. As far as I'm concerned, because it's just. I, 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 see. I don't know, John. I, did you? I mean, the second time I pulled the lyrics up because okay. it's with prog rock. It's gonna be. 
especially with something like that. Uh, now, I will say I'm surprised you guys didn't pick up some themes with like the time signatures and the tempo change stuff and the callbacks because to me it's hard to listen to a piece that's you know 20 some odd minutes mm -hmm. without like when i see that i'm automatically trained like my brain is trained on something like that to listen for that stuff because you can't make a 20 minute piece of music whether you're a jam band or classical or jazz you know free jazz or this without having shifts you know and callbacks and time i mean no can you think of anybody that just even like that allman brothers stuff that went like 18 19 minutes right mm -hmm. there were callbacks there but part of the reason that stuff blended together for me was because there weren't enough um time signature changes and stuff you know and then callbacks so that you realize what they're trying to do and how they're trying to build on it you know they're just shifting all over yeah. so that was something that clicked immediately but yeah i pulled the lyrics up and it's I mean, it's <laughs> like a lot of prog rock albums. I'm not 100%. I mean, unlike um, Aqualung, where it was clear they were talking about like Christianity and organized religion. Um, right. I mean, it was very obvious listening to those songs. Um, this, I, I have to be honest, I have no idea what the framework of this is, even looking at the lyrics. Did you, did you what, what's the, the thematic stuff lyrically, Matt? I didn't even come across a whole lot of that, to be honest. I don't know. Okay, I mean, I, I mean was, but the story of a genius boy, right? And yeah, like, story. I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that was kind of what. Yeah, I, but it doesn't really go into like. It's like it seems like he's kind of, um, like, kind of nuts too, right? Like, is <laughs> well, yeah, they said of... he had psychological problems. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but it's not like it's real direct, you know, like other stuff. So it's. I wouldn't say this is a lyrics album. Let's put it that no. way. I think this piece, I think this was made to showcase like most prog rock is the, the skills of the musicians and, you know, good prog rock manages to make you impressed without it being overly masturbatory and bad prog rock seems like a circle jerk, you know, and this didn't delve into circle jerk for me. <laughs> um, and that to me, that's my prog rock. Is this a circle jerk or is this like, <laughs> able to be listened to without it seeming like just a math problem or a you know self-congratulatory you know music mm. piece and you know, it's, I, it's also hard with pr bands because they're constantly subbing out men i feel like you can't make a prog rock album you know of big without changing a member or two every single mm -hmm. album it feels like yeah well and, and again too thematically you know one of the main things that they were trying to do here was just make fun of everything that's like this you know so through the idea that you're coming up with ridiculous lyrics that are hard to like what the hell are they talking about it's intentional you know and then you've got yeah. all the stories about the child genius and you know people thinking that he's real it's like they you know in some ways <laughs> they were getting what they want but no john's right i mean this is you know it's like hey and again, it wasn't it wasn't started off as, hey, let's just do this long suite. It just happened to be like that. It's just it just kind of fell the place, it fell together. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I no, it's not that John, it's not that I didn't pick up on the time signatures and the callbacks. It's just that when I it, they do it a lot, first of all, and they do it a mm -hmm. lot with different parts. So I'm just saying by the time I got that, I became more familiar with it. I was when a, when a part came up, I was questioning you know, exactly where's the first time that I hear that, you know, like I'm still parsing yeah. all that out. So it's just, yeah. it was more of that, but, um, I was uh, the first time I'm not going to lie, but yeah. the second time I recognized, okay, that's a piece that's going to run through it. Cause I was familiar with it from the first yeah. time. Well, and I love how it loops together. It starts and ends with the same, that same acoustic guitar part, you know, with the yep. same, I really don't mind if you sit this one out. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's what that's that, that certainly is like, it like bookends, you know, it's like the whole, the whole, you know, musical story of it going through everything. So, um, so I, I like all that stuff. I like the different time signatures when you have prog rock, a lot of times you've got just these weird offbeats, these weird, like, uh, you know, guitar strumming, you know, uh, structure, and stuff like that that just for me a lot of times i hear it and i go "Ooh, like you know that's different you know i wasn't expecting that like they, they take all these little turns and stuff mm -hmm. and you know to me as a music fan i really like that whether it's in a prog song or it's in a regular song you know if you do something a little different uh yeah so can i, mean, I there's, there's, can yeah, i play a game with you here matt because i wrote down instruments i think i hear but i'm not sure if i heard them now oh. you mentioned the lute which i thought i heard it yeah. was in there right because there's yeah. like 
there's got to be like 30 instruments on this like it feels like yeah i think i think i heard the xylophone at one point on this um piano organ harpsichord uh i don't see okay. anything about a xylophone i mean this i'm okay. just i just have wikipedia up here but maybe it I, could be yeah maybe i was wrong okay i feel like i heard that old uh, i we've been doing enough albums now where i actually feel like i know what the hammond organ sounds like now <laughs> was there hammond organ on this uh it says it just says organ it doesn't okay. say Hammond. It could be though. You know what I mean? Like, and then that's there's, the other like, thing. there's a lot of hard, it's hard organ. It's like mm -hmm. the guy's like, yeah, there yeah. is a lot of organ on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on this Thick as yep. a brick with hard organ. Is that what you're <laughs> yeah. saying? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of strings and brass on here too. Probably all the brass and all the strings. is my yes, guess. There's so like a, there's I'm not like going to try to parse them out. I just heard lots of, there's them. like an and woodwinds at the end. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Woodwinds as well. It's like all the instruments I learned in band, but struggle to like differentiate certain ones of them you know like i know yeah. the difference between like a sax and a trumpet right but i don't know much of the difference between like you know a other violin things. and a viola like a violin and a viola yeah or like you a... said there's an accordion on this too right or yeah he plays an accordion there's an accordion yeah he does accordion really? uh-huh yeah jeez i don't know where but it's in there yeah. somewhere well, it still gets a recommend recommend for me that's gonna yeah. be my take there yeah and i would say i don't know i mean again and josh you might not want to do this but i'm just that like if you're not familiar with this type of stuff, like even me as being someone that's familiar, I, this is something I got to listen to a lot to really, to yeah. really get. Um, but I like doing that, you know, and there's, unless there's not, unless there, I can tell right away, I'm like, there's not enough here to keep me going. Like, I don't know if I need to listen to a ton of more yes to really understand it. I think I got, but this to me, there's enough cool stuff going on here. Um, and the more I did listen to it, the more I liked it. So, uh, so yeah, this is a little, a little bit more homeworky, I guess you could mm. say. So thumbs up for me, thumbs up from John. I don't, Josh. What would you say? Middle. Yeah, I'd down. Say, I'd say middle. Question mark shrug emoji. Know, <laughs> shrug emoji. <laughs> well, hey, if you guys, if if this was enough to satiate your uh, your appetite, you you've got uh, thick as a brick too. In what? 2012, Ian Anderson <laughs> yes. had the uh, the follow up album. It's a solo. It's not Jethro Tull album. It's Ian Anderson. But you okay. can thicker you brick, can think. thick thicker bricks, <laughs> harder yes, and organ. Th yeah. And I think it's like it's <laughs> harder organ. Thick as a brick too. And it's like uh, what is it? What's the that's the subtitle? Even it's, more uh, brick. What, no, whatever. <laughs> whatever. What's happens? another phallic emoji we could put on this? Can we think another thing? Like yeah. It's actually whatever happened to Gerald Bostock. So you get to <laughs> oh, find out what happened to, to Mr. Bostock. See, there. that seems like the lyrics would be important when you're putting stuff like that on. As... Well, this goes into that, you know, <laughs> masturbatory versus, you know, yeah. true inspiration. And it walks that line. It's like yeah. the old, the first prog rocker in many ways was Pete Townsend, right? Like he made these great things, but also a lot of times it's like, I'm not sure what the hell this story is, but like, good on you, Peter Townsend for doing yeah. it. And he continued it with his solo career too, you know? So yeah. 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 So, so uh, this is the last time we're covering Jethro Tull, either in a proper episode or best uh, cold listen hot take. So just to wrap up, they did continue to make uh, prog album albums in the '70s and the years that followed. I think the next album they actually did was another straight one song album. Um, but then they did morph into different genres, including folk rock and electronic music. And they got they got some '80s albums out there that sound very much '80s. Um, <laughs> so those are kind of interesting. Uh, and famously, and I think John, you might have mentioned this at some point. I know we've talked about this before, but the uh, the, the Grammys, the, the the Academy of the Recording Registry, uh, came up with a new category in 1989: Best Hard Rock Slash Metal Performance. Yes, uh, of, of the year. they won it. Yep, and they won. They beat out Metallica's <laughs> their <laughs> album Crest of a Nave. Crest of a Nave beat out Metallica's and Justice for All in the Give first year that this was. And this has been later, and it also beat out albums by Jane's Addiction, ACDC, and. Iggy Pop, and that it same is year. well worth looking at their acceptance speech too, because they look as surprised as. Well, no, it's that not they that they weren't there. They yeah, didn't. I was gonna say. I was gonna say it's like the people reading it. I'm saying, look. Yeah, shocked. I forget. Yeah. I forget who who was the one that that won. But the, oh, it was Alice Cooper, I think maybe yep. that presented it, and mm -hmm. they at the audience booed because everybody thought yeah. the Metallica <laughs> was going to. And the band Jethro Tull actually didn't go to the Grammys because their manager was like, "Look, Metallica is going to win this. Yeah. We're well, not sending you they, out there to, to not win." Yeah. You know? The idea was they thought the Grammys literally created the category for Metallica to so like <laughs> sort of like that. There's rumors that they like, did it because you know Metallica was right. You know they were 
the next album was the black album right and they were yeah. they're they gonna break in you know to the mainstream and so it's like they created this thing and people just thought oh this is for metallica and yep jethro tall and they yeah. didn't even show up because they didn't think they were gonna right win. yeah it's alice cooper's hilarious reading that by the way so, and Enter- yeah. entertainment weekly came up with a couple of years ago came up with like the worst grammy you know wins of all this was number one this was <laughs> this is widely considered to be the worst grammy awarded ever um in response they, the, the academy got s- slammed for this and they actually um so they created separate categories of best hard rock performance and best metal performance. Mm-hmm. Um, in response about all of this in an interview, Ian Anderson quipped, well, we do sometimes play our mandolins very loudly. <laughs> so uh, I got a Touché. kick out of that. And then when Metallica actually did win for best metal performance uh, Lars for their Black album in 1992, Lars Oldrich said, uh, first thing we're going to do is thank Jethro Tull for not putting out an album this year. Well, uh, and also if there's irony to that because that was the album where many metalheads thought that Metallica was no longer metal. No longer <laughs> so, metal, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> so it all goes full circle. It's a makeup yeah. call, an ump's makeup mm-hmm. call. Um, so Jethro Tull, actually, they disbanded for a bit in 2012, but they got back together in 2017, and they're still around. And then actually in March of this year, Anderson announced the title of Jethro Tull, Tull's forthcoming 22nd studio album, The Zealot Game. Um, it's their first new actual studio album in nearly 20 years. So, uh, But they still tour a lot, and uh, so you can get a new Jethro Tull album. Wow. soon at some point right. and finally they are not Jesus, in the rock Matt. they are not in the rock and roll hall of fame john oh. they are not they, oh, they, they, shucks. They, they've never made the short list uh that is surprising being, though i have to say yeah they've been eligible since 1993 and ian anderson said uh it would nice to be <laughs> it would be nice to be not able to talk about the grammys and even more so the american rock and roll hall of fame i mean i find these events really rather tedious it's america i don't come from america i don't play american music i don't belong in the rock and roll hall of fame and the grammy thing was just a one-off little moment where five thousand members of the national academy of recording artists decided to award to jethro tull rather than metallica so as far as ian anderson's concerned don't put him in he doesn't want to be there well that lines up with him though he's kind of yeah. you know a mercurial guy yeah mm-hmm. yep. so so there you go awesome. okay 